August 1942 brings America's first ground invasion of the war. It's D-Day on Guadalcanal as the Marines storm ashore nine months to the day since Pearl Harbor. Through swamps and streams they advance. The goal, take that airstrip first spotted by Coast Watcher Martin Clemens. Almost as soon as the invasion begins, Japanese bombers go airborne to take out the Marines. But the Japanese, forced to do daylight bombing runs, are stretched to their limit, taking off from Rabaul. They have to fly non-stop, some 1,100 miles. With barely enough fuel, they must fly in a straight, predictable line over the islands occupied by Coast Watchers and their scouts. Without advance warning, the Americans would be sitting ducks. That warning comes from Coast Watchers Paul Mason and Jack Reed on Bougainville, high on a jungle ridge, right under the Japanese flight path. Within a few seconds, we all heard it coming from the northwest, the dull, ever-increasing sound of a host of planes approaching our location. Some of the lads climbed to the treetops as our view was obscured from that direction. In a matter of moments, the largest aircraft formation I'd ever seen raced across a break in the jungle. 27 Japanese dive bombers roared across the sky in the direction of Tulagi. Mason and Reed send a brief but potent message. 40 bombers hitting yours. Four simple words that saved countless lives by giving the American planes and ships time to scramble. The only way that a U.S. fighter plane called a Wildcat can take on the Zero is by having lots and lots of altitude advantage over the Zero. So when they get those Coast Watcher reports, take off and get up to about 35,000 feet. When the Japanese Zeros appear over Guadalcanal, the U.S. Wildcats come flying down out of the sky, guns blazing. Back on Bougainville, the Coast Watchers know the message got through. On other islands, Coast Watching scouts like Jimmy Bennett confirm the success. There used to be hundreds and hundreds of Japanese planes flying over Munda to Guadalcanal, bomb Guadalcanal. And when they returned, only a few of them returned. Most of them been shot down. The forces that control Guadalcanal command the approaches to Australia. Advance warning was critical because the odds were stacked against the Americans. The Japanese Zero could simply outfly the primary American fighter plane, the Wildcat, a sobering fact reinforced in a training film starring future American president Ronald Reagan. First trailing edge taper, just rounded, slight dihedral angle. You might add to that that there are two 20 millimeter cannons. Yes. There are many turning points that could have gone in the Japanese favor had not that information from the Coast Watchers been delivered in a timely fashion. This battle was a key turning point in the battle for the Pacific. No armchair commander, Admiral Nimitz comes all the way from Hawaii to decorate Major General Vandegrift, whose fighting Marines captured the airfield from the Japs and held it against all odds. By early 1943, the Allies have won the Battle of Guadalcanal. But the Japanese, frustrated their movements are being monitored every step of the way, wage full-scale war on the spies in the jungle. Many are captured and killed. All on the run, they're scared, tired, and lonely. I'm feeling rather low and discouraged. Yet, Martin Clemens took time to write love letters to his fiance. My dearest Anne, I'm on a lonely hilltop and it's pouring cats and dogs. His daughter, Alexandra, has boxes and boxes of the letters. I still love you an awful, awful lot. I get more impatient every day of being away from you. It bothered him greatly, his concern for his fiancee. Felt a duty to be there to protect her. He'd promised Anne's two brothers, heading off to war themselves, if anything happened to them, he'd return to watch over their sister. I can quite understand your anxiety, but didn't I promise you I was bound to come back and that you weren't to worry? That would be a tough promise to keep. And you're hounded from pillar to post by the Japanese, and they would have been chasing them because they'd have radio direction finding set up to find them. They'd be hopping from hill to hill to try and it must have been a very, very frightening experience. Now desperate for even more Coast Watchers, the Allies turned to submarines and PT boats to sneak men behind enemy lines. 
They had a very short life expectancy. Commander Ted Robinson inserted Coast Watchers onto islands crawling with Japanese troops. We'd put them ashore in a uh, little rubber Avon raft all of it at night, and they'd paddle ashore in the surf. And when they got in, they would blow up the Avon raft. There goes their rescue. They're inserted with uh, minimal gear, often by submarines. Uh, they were limited in, in the amount that they could get ashore. In many cases, the only way to get supplies was by tricky airdrops. And we used a system of fire to let the aircraft know where we were. But the airdrops could give away their positions. It was quite frightening. Linda Cooper and her husband Jeff were coast watchers on Santa Isabel. One time we thought a plane was coming very low and just said, oh, that's one Allied plane. And we waved and it was a Japanese plane, but it did us firing shots around up. Bleeding in the nose, he thought a bullet already got him, so he got a very shot at his. <laughs> he fired at his plane, and the plane just disappeared. And there was another unspoken fear that natives would turn coast watchers over to the Japanese. Some of Pacific Islanders were quite indifferent to, you know, whether it was the the Caucasians or the or the Japanese who were. Uh, ruling the roost. The Solomon Islanders were bewildered by this war. Smoking out the enemy wherever he may be lurking. It's referred to as the Big Death. That's the way it's translated. It was white people killing white people. Thankfully, the Coast Watchers had established a level of trust, whereas the Japanese took and stole and plundered and hurt the Solomon Islanders. So it was easy for most of the Islanders to choose sides. The Coast Watchers' relationship with the, their indigenous supporters is extraordinary. A lot of those people, of course, didn't have to risk their lives, but the Coast Watchers' uh, ability, their gift perhaps, was to inspire loyalty. Uh, and it's the partnership between them that really is amazing. Bear in mind, our intelligence was gained mainly from natives. Thousands of natives were recruited, and many volunteered willingly for the really dangerous stuff. If they'd have treated the native population better than what they did, we wouldn't have been able to gain any intelligence. Coast Watcher Mick Collins was on New Britain and says Japanese brutality towards the locals played right into the Coast Watcher's hands. The Japanese came in and picked all the ripe fruit, so this made the salt runners damned angry. Worst of all, they um, assaulted the women. The natives became the scouts for the Coast Watchers, given drawings and silhouettes to help identify ships and planes. While they're intelligent, they are not technically sophisticated. So Martin Clemens figured out one way to get them to give him the information that he needed about a certain size ship, for example, was to say, how big were the guns on that ship? Were they this big? Were they this big? Related to the size of a coconut log. Well, any Solomon Islander could do that. Joan Aldrin is inspired on the Jeffs. Jimmy Bennett and Elisa Basili were scouts for a Coast Watcher on New Georgia Island, monitoring the construction of an enemy airfield in Munda. Then, they, then we started watching the Japanese report all the movement. They hid on islands across the lagoon. But not uh, walk about on the sun, sun, we walk on a rock. Footprints in the sand would be a dead giveaway for Japanese patrols. So very careful because sometimes Japanese they go to the island and uh, and we will spot our footprint. And we were told not to go to the Japs, they are the enemy. So for, well, not one of us worked for the Japs. The most famous scout was undoubtedly Jacob Vuza. While spying for Clemens, he was spotted carrying a U.S. flag and grabbed and tortured by the Japanese just before their first ground attack to take back Henderson Field. And the Japanese were questioning him, tied him to a tree and bayoneted him. He lost quite a lot of blood at the time and uh, sort of fainted. As the Japanese are questioning him, first American planes flew in to land at Henderson. John Innes has painstakingly studied the island's battlefields. The Japanese saw the American stars on them and they started to panic. They're not just questioning him now, they're saying, tell us, tell us. They're jabbing him with their bayonets. He said to the Japanese, I'll take you to the Americans. So he led the Japanese to this point here. They've got here just after midnight, and uh, as soon as the attack has started, or the shooting started, he's ducked away, made his way around to the American lines. He led the Japanese right into a virtual ambush by the American Marines. Bleeding and near death, 
He refused treatment until providing intel confirming the Japanese were attacking in strength in what became the Battle of the Tenaru. A company of men walk across here and stumble into the barbed wire. The shooting starts. Uchiki sends another company across here and across the water to help these guys, and in no time at all, he's blown away 300 men. So the fighting continues all night. The Americans won that iconic battle. Hundreds of Japanese soldiers were mowed down. Ruza recovered to join many scouting trips with the Marines, and his actions and leadership prompted many more natives to come forward and help the Allies. And all remember him as the man who marched the Japanese right into the American guns. Sergeant Ruza's vote of confidence in the Allies is an important part of keeping the Solomon Islanders on the side of Australia and America. He was eventually knighted by Queen Elizabeth. He loved the Americans like you wouldn't believe, but he loved them so much, he renamed his village. You want to know where California is? It's just the other side of Carly Point. He's renamed his village California. It's here he's buried in a simple grave, one of the great heroes of Guadalcanal. If Jacob Vuza was the most famous scout, Aran Kumani comes close for the pure history he helped make, saving the life of a future American president.